If a company has poor governance and poor stakeholder management, that exposes it to several risks. On the other hand, effective governance and effective stakeholder management will lead to many benefits. Let's start with the risks of poor governance and stakeholder management. A major risk is weak control systems. So if a company has poor control systems, this will lead to inefficient monitoring. So if shareholders cannot oversee what the board of directors are doing, or the board of directors do not carefully monitor what management is doing, then there is the risk of one stakeholder group benefiting at the expense of the company. A classic situation is where the board of directors does not adequately control and monitor management and management then makes decisions that benefit them at the expense of the company. Another issue is ineffective decision making. As we have said in other parts of this reading, there is the risk of information asymmetry between management and the board. Now let's say that we have this company and the information available to management far exceeds the information available to the board. Now in these situations management might make investment decisions that suit them but are not in the best interest of the company. So for example there might be a decision to expand which will increase the compensation level and the stature of management but let's say that this project is not one that will increase the overall value of the company. So in that sense the shareholders will not benefit but management will benefit because they are overseeing a larger project and hence can claim higher compensation. Next we come to legal, regulatory and reputational risks. Now again this connects with weak control systems. If in a given country a company is required to follow certain regulation but the corporate governance structure is weak and the regulation is not being followed then it is possible that the company is exposed to the risk of legal action from the government or from the regulatory body. There is also a risk that the company is not looking after the interests of customers or not looking after the interests of employees. In this case, the risk is that the customers or the employees file a lawsuit against the company, which in turn will hurt the reputation of the company. Default and bankruptcy risk. So if the company is not carefully managing creditors' interests, then the company might face default and bankruptcy risk. We've talked about the fact that poor corporate governance exposes a company to many risks. The flip side of the coin is that effective governance and effective stakeholder management leads to several benefits which are shown over here. Now throughout this reading we talk about elements of effective corporate governance and effective stakeholder management. Here is just a list of some elements. If roles and responsibilities are well defined, and now this includes the roles and responsibilities of the board, the various committees within the board, the senior management, as well as other layers of management, then that will automatically lead to operational efficiency of the company. If we have effective audit systems, and there is careful monitoring of compliance with both internal policies and external regulations that will lead to improved control across different levels of the company. If procedures are defined to deal with conflicts of interest and third party transactions that will also lead to improved control. If compensation policies are well defined whereby the compensation of senior executives is linked with the performance of the company, then that will lead to better operating and financial performance of the company. Even the benefits are linked with each other. So if the company is performing well operationally, in other words, there is high operational efficiency, that also leads to better operating and financial performance. If there is a high level of transparency which addresses the information asymmetry that we have between shareholders and managers, 
then this high transparency can help reduce the cost of raising capital companies that are transparent about their financials and their operations find it easier to raise money if companies have good creditor management systems in place then they can borrow money at a lower cost so that lowers default risk and it also lowers the cost of debt so these are just some of the major benefits and from an exam perspective i'd strongly encourage you to learn all these benefits section 8 deals with what an analyst must consider when evaluating the corporate governance and stakeholder management practices of a company at a high level here are the basic questions that need to be evaluated and these will be covered over the next few slides let's start with the most basic element which is economic ownership and voting control now with most companies there is a one share one vote structure which means that if a given shareholder owns 20% of the company then the voting also is 20% so a majority shareholder with 51% of the shares can then also control the direction of the company some companies offer dual class shares where different classes of shares have different voting rights one example is where we have class a shares and class b shares class a shares offer one vote per share whereas class b shares have several votes per share typically it's the founding family or insiders that would own class b shares so even though their percentage ownership might be low because each share has multiple votes they can still retain control of the company another situation is where we have two classes of shares one class elects the majority of the board and these would be the shares that the insiders have and then the non insiders the other party would own a class of shares with which they can elect the minority shareholders now here again through this mechanism the insiders will retain control of the board and by retaining control of the board they will in essence retain control of the company now the general case for dual class shares is that this promotes long term stability of the company it becomes harder for outside investors or activist investors to come and take over the company and move it in a different direction the case against is that there's a conflict of interest between the providers of capital and the management of the business the implication being here that the management of the business is in essence when evaluating dual class shares investors should consider the motivations of the controlling party generational dynamics succession planning and relationship between the board and management now this is fairly straightforward let's say you are investing in a company like facebook where the founder of facebook has control so he has control by owning shares that have greater voting rights than the shares that you might be buying now you need to understand the motivation of the party that is controlling the company you should also understand the generational dynamics and succession planning so so let's say you are comfortable with the motivations of the current owner but what will happen when the company moves to the next generation will you still be comfortable with the fact that you do not have voting control the next point has to do with the board of directors it's important to evaluate the experience and skill of the non executive directors the executive directors are those who already work at the company so by definition they need to have the right skills but we need to make sure that the non executive directors have the right skills which meet the current needs of the company as well as the future needs of the company remuneration and company performance with most companies senior executives get a compensation which consists of a base salary 
short term bonuses and multi year incentive plans now what we need to evaluate is whether this compensation is aligned multi year incentive plans could include stock options that vest over a certain period of time when evaluating the effectiveness of a compensation package an analyst should look at the following items is there alignment with shareholders in other words is this compensation package such that managers will act in the best interest of shareholders a package that includes let's say stock options which vest over several years will align the interest of managers with shareholders we should also look at whether there is a variation in results so if a compensation package claims to be aligned with shareholders but we notice that over several years the company performance is going up and down but the compensation package the overall compensation that managers are getting is fairly stable that would imply a lack of alignment between shareholders and managers we should also compare the compensation package with similar companies in the industry and ideally companies that have had a similar performance so if we have two companies a and b both are in the same industry and both have experienced roughly the same performance over the last few years but the senior managers of b receive a compensation that is substantially higher than the senior managers of a then that would raise some questions about whether this compensation is fair sometimes managers might receive compensation tied to specific milestones there is nothing inherently wrong with that but analysts should determine whether the compensation package that is aligned with milestones is also in the best interest of shareholders the final point here has to do with relevance to current situation now you might have a company that was a startup a few years ago but has now matured the question is whether senior managers are being compensated based on the current state of the company if the compensation is based on the assumption that the company is still a startup even though it is now somewhat mature then that should raise a flag analysts should evaluate who are the major shareholders in a particular company so if this is the company being evaluated and this company has some major cross holdings cross holdings is where another company let's say has a 20% stake over here now this will be a cause for concern because generally when another company has some sort of an interest in company a then the implication is that the other company will generally vote along with the management of this company so this will be a source of concern for other shareholders a somewhat similar situation is that of an affiliated stockholder an affiliated stockholder might be an individual or a family trust an endowment or a private equity fund that owns a substantial stake in a company now the case for an affiliated stockholder again is that it promotes long term stability the case against is that there might be a conflict of interest between the affiliated stockholder and the other shareholders here again the implication is that the affiliated stockholder will generally vote along with the management of the company the concern here would be that the affiliated stockholder will be aligned with the senior management of the company we should also evaluate whether any activist shareholders are interested in the company so we've talked about activist shareholders before and there are several instances where active shareholders can quickly change the composition of a company so activist shareholders can rally other investors who have a short term perspective and try to get several new shareholders whose interests are aligned with those of the activist shareholder strength of shareholder rights now 
when evaluating companies in a given jurisdiction, we should look at the specific companies and compare the corporate governance charters of these companies to determine which company has provisions that are more shareholder friendly. Now the bigger picture here is that within a certain jurisdiction there will be rules and regulations that companies need to follow but the question is that within the context of that jurisdiction which company is giving the greatest amount of protection to shareholders and obviously as potentially new investors we would prefer companies that give greater protection to shareholders. There are some countries which have a comply or explain type of regulation. What this means is that even though corporate governance related regulations exist, but a company can deviate from those regulations as long as it clearly discloses why it has deviated from the code. As an analyst, we need to understand those deviations and we should invest in those companies only if those deviations make sense to us. The final point has to do with looking at long term risks. So we should evaluate how well a company is managing long term risks. Long term risks include environment risk, how well a company is managing its human capital and so on. Now this area is fairly subjective. So the curriculum recommends that analysts should look at a pattern of fines or accidents, regulatory penalties and investigations. So if there is a pattern of any of these, then obviously that will be a cause for concern. ESG integration, also called ESG investing, deals with the consideration of environmental, social and governance factors in the investment process. The terms sustainable investing and responsible investing are also sometimes used synonymously with ESG investing. A term that's been around for a while is socially responsible investing. This refers to situations where an investor avoids companies that he is morally opposed to. So for example, some investors avoid companies that deal with alcohol, tobacco and firearms. So in the past that has been referred to as socially responsible investing. Increasingly now, socially responsible investing refers to strategies that incorporate environmental factors, social factors and governance factors. Over the last decade, there has been an increasing awareness of ESG factors and this has also become important to investors. In fact, the assets under management that consider ESG factors has gone up considerably. Another reason for this is the higher amount of disclosure related to ESG factors. The curriculum talks about several high profile cases that involve environmental factors. One has to do with BP where a massive oil spill resulted in billions of dollars of losses Another case is that of Walmart which faced numerous employee strikes and several lawsuits over labor and human rights violations. The increased importance of ESG investing can also be attributed to universal owners. Universal owners are long term investors with substantial holdings in diversified portfolios. These universal owners are impacted by the global economy and what is happening to the environment. The reason is they have large investments in different kinds of companies. So obviously if there is a major environmental impact or a major social impact that will cause some of their portfolios to perform poorly. So they have an interest in ensuring that environmental factors and social factors are dealt with appropriately. From a testability perspective, it is important to understand specific environmental factors and social factors that have to be considered as part of one's investment analysis. So here are some of the environmental factors and I would suggest you simply learn these. 
one is natural resource management so how well is a company managing the natural resources that it is dealing with another is pollution prevention so if you have a company engaged in the oil and gas industry so how is such a company dealing with pollution another is water conservation we also have energy efficiency and reduced emissions the existence of carbon assets and the adherence to environmental safety and regulatory standards now there is obviously a lot of detail behind each of these but from a testability perspective as long as you remember these basic terms you are in good shape there are several social factors of which i've just listed a few over here when an investor is thinking of buying let's say nike stock the question is how well does this company deal with human rights now if a company has uh, let's say factories in bangladesh where there is an excessive amount of child labor being used which violates human rights standards then that will raise a question mark there will also be issues related to community impact so an investor might ask whether the company he is investing in is having a positive community impact or a negative community impact investors will also be concerned about the ethics policies of companies now again as i said there are several other social factors but these are some of the most important ones there are several different esg implementation methods some of the core ones are shown over here one is negative screening so in essence what this is saying is that an investor identifies some screens and based on those screens does not decide to invest in certain companies so for example a screen might say that i do not want to invest in a company which is polluting the environment or a company that is violating some basic human rights so based on that screen a certain set of companies would be eliminated that would be negative screening positive screening says that an investor is trying to identify companies that follow esg related principles so actively investing in companies that are concerned with the environment and concerned with social aspects best in class takes this thought process one step further where investors identify the best scoring esg companies to invest in thematic investing strategies consider a single factor such as energy efficiency or climate change so if there's a particular factor that is of interest to a given investor the investor might go for companies that are focused on that particular aspect so if an investor is particularly interested in renewable energy they will try to identify companies that work in that space impact investing deals with investing in companies that have a positive social impact and where there is also an economic return an example of impact investing would be the purchase of a climate bond or a green bond now with a green bond for example the money raised through the issue of this bond will be invested in companies that are trying to focus on alternative energy projects the idea being that when you invest in such a bond you are encouraging alternative energy projects so not only are you helping improve the environment but you are also hoping that these projects will have a positive economic return so this is based on the idea that something that is socially good can also be economically beneficial another important term is esg integration this is also called esg incorporation this has to do with the integration of both qualitative and quantitative esg factors into industry analysis and security analysis specifically an analyst should look at the possible risks that arise from esg factors and whether a company is managing its environmental social and governance resources in accordance with a sustainable business model that brings us to the end of this reading it is fairly long and theoretical and it is 
quite hard to remember all the facts but what I'll do here is emphasize some of the most important points that you need to remember. Now the first point is the definition of corporate governance. So you need to recognize that there is no standard definition but broadly speaking corporate governance deals with the rules and regulations and the policies and procedures that align the interests of shareholders with management. Now there are other definitions also that deal with stakeholders. So recognize that there is no standard definition. There are a category of definitions that are based on the relationship between shareholders and the company or the company managers and then there are another set of definitions that take a stakeholder perspective. You need to understand the different stakeholders of the company. So for example, the shareholders, the board of directors, the managers, the employees, customers, suppliers, the government and the regulators are all stakeholders of a company. It is extremely important to recognize the principal agent problem. The principal agent problem is where the owner or principal hires an agent. In this case, the agent should be working in the best interest of the principal. But the problem might be that the agent is working in his own best interest. We need to understand the different tools and mechanisms of adequate stakeholder management. We need to understand the responsibilities of the board of directors and the various committees within the board of directors. We need to recognize the various factors that impact corporate governance. We have to recognize that there are several risks associated with poor corporate governance. So we need to know those risks. We should also recognize that if a company has a good corporate governance system in place, then that will lead to several benefits. As an analyst, we need to understand what factors to consider when analyzing a company's corporate governance structure and finally we need to understand environmental and social considerations in investment analysis. That is it for this reading.